I didn't start life having any real intentions of working in the outdoors. I started out doing something completely different. Um, as you can see, this is uh, the predicament that I found myself in, in my day job. I am for my sins in the course of the week a lawyer. But you can see how happy I am doing that job. And my weekend summer time I spend looking a bit more like this because I'm up in the mountains in this particular shot, 5,200 meters in the Indian Himalayas, which is um, where I was last summer with the BSES expedition. Um, the BSES are an organization um, which have been around uh, hundreds of years, and they are intending to take young people between the ages of 16 and 21 into the outdoors and take them on one month or three months expeditions to genuinely put them in an environment where nobody else has been before. And that's essentially what the BS is all about, taking people out of their comfort zone and taking them into wild environments and allowing them to sort of have the opportunity to try and find out whether or not that's something they might want to do in a career path. Um, in terms of my career progression, um, as a lawyer, it's extremely difficult to find yourself in a situation where you have enough time to be able to think, well, if I want to do a career in the outdoors, how do I do it? How do I transition between the one and the two? You just quit your full-time job and throw yourself in at the deep end. It's not actually a very easy thing to do because you, one, you don't get paid. Secondly, if you do get paid, you don't get paid an awful lot when you start out. So you have to try and work out a way of juggling the two. In my case, what I did here was start out with some really basic stuff back about sort of seven or eight years ago when I started doing this. UK mountain leader training, uh, UK survival school training, just weekend warrior courses. Just getting out there into the hills, meeting people, where you get the opportunity to talk to everybody, find out what's going on, learn a bit about navigation, about how to, how to manage people in extreme environments, how to deal with responsibility, how to deal with decision making, risk analysis of situations, and generally outdoor competencies. Anyway, um, I was lucky enough, to, um, does anybody here aware of um, um, that the Royal Geographic Society once a year runs a, a huge organization um, called Explore, which is a weekend where people just pile in and get to meet each other. Um, and it's a bit like this in a way, but they have hundreds of people. It's just a networking event, happens every October. Lots of people turn up. Everybody talks about polar environments, desert environments. There are medical doctors. There are people doing lots of everything you can think of in the way of careers in the outdoors and opportunities to meet people who work out how to do it. Anyway, while I was there, I was lucky enough to meet a guy who was representing an organization called um, International Wilderness, Wilderness Leadership School, which is an organization run out of Alaska that um, allows one to get all of those qualifications, all of those guide training expeditions, all out of the way. I went to, I signed up immediately, quit my job at JP Morgan, um, traveled out to Alaska where I spent three months doing, as you can see from this, um, one month doing ski mountaineering expedition, another month doing um, whitewater rafting competencies and hiking, and another month sea kayaking. And got all these qualifications in the space of three months, which, you know, and at the same time as you're doing that, you're out in this environment, you have the opportunity to be a leader for the day, you're doing coursework what at the same time as you're doing this, so you actually end up with professional qualifications such as avalanche skills, uh, sea kayaking qualifications, and all of the kind of interpersonal skills that are required on a day-to-day -day basis being a leader. Um, that's basically it. That allowed me to have the competencies to do, get onto a BSES expedition, and from that, as you can see here, this is sort of in the future now, but um, because of my experience and time I spent in Alaska, I'm now planning and running my own chief leader expedition as a chief leader in 2012, which is a three-month expedition, BSES expedition, happening in Alaska. So as you can see, in a very reasonably short space of time, while I've managed to more or less hold down a career as a lawyer, I've managed to go from being having just weekend trips away doing mountain leader stuff to actually managing my own expedition in 2012. 
Anyway, what I'm going to talk about now is briefly a bit more about mountaineering uh, generally and one of the BSES expeditions which um, I managed. Um, I was the fire leader of last year's Uncharted Himalayas expedition into, um, into the Indian Himalayas. North of Leh, um, the Indian Himalayas is uh, extremely remote. It's a beautiful region. There's not very many people up there. And the expedition company that assisted with this expedition um, ensured us that there had been no Westerners that had actually ever been through this environment before. So we were actually the first people to, you know, if you like, cut our teeth in the Than Glasgow Valley, which is north of Leh. And this is my fire. The way that BS, BSES works is they generally have, um, if they can, between 40 and 60 um, teenage young explorers on any expedition. And these are divided into groups of roughly 10. And each one of those groups is called a fire. And I was on this occasion a fire leader, which means that I have responsibility for these chaps. Um, and fantastic crew they were too. Um, Move me on. Uh, this is a question that, for some reason, these outdoor people and everybody else at the BSCS seems to think it's important to want to know what's involved in a typical day. And so, obviously, you do the obvious thing and go, well, there's no such thing as a typical day, but there might be some consistencies, shall we say, that happen in a day. One typical day on an expedition might involve some walking, for example, and there we all are walking in through a gorge. Um, of course, that wouldn't be the case if you're on a sea kayaking expedition, but in many other cases, walking reasonably long distances through beautiful environments such as this is something that you're going to find yourself doing. Um, managing people in the outdoors is, is, is difficult. People walk at different speeds, people complain, people can't carry anything, people pass out because of the heat. People want to show how fit they are because they're headstrong. So you have a you have a narrow starting point of people. Everybody's in a group, but it slowly drags itself out like this. And you have to try and keep all these people together. You have to keep them happy, and you have to keep them all in a place where they're all happy to operate with, amongst each other. Okay, second point in a typical expedition day um, might, on the off chance, involve some camping. <laughs> um, what happens here in the size of this expedition, you can see this is more like a Raj uh, sort of laying siege to part of Kashmir. Actually, what it happens is there is 40 young explorers on this expedition, 15 leaders, 10 cooks, 10 Sherpas, 70 horses, and about 40 horsemen to manage the horses, carrying all your equipment and all their equipment. And when everything is set up, it looks like this. It's a huge undertaking. And this is what the BS is all about. It's not about taking small groups of people and taking them on adventure holidays. It's about a real expedition, and that's what this is. OK, third point of a, um, a typical day might involve <laughs> obstacles. Uh, this, of course, is a, 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 I had a photograph of which I was originally thinking to use here, which is a photograph of the side view of the bridge, and you can see the water running underneath. And it just looks like a bridge, which, of course, when you're walking up to it, is not a problem. But when you're actually faced with this, you know, we're in the third world, a developing world country, you have a situation where you have to deal with risks which there's no safety monitors for that bridge. How many of you guys here, you know, just happily, with a heavy rucksack on, cross that? <laughs> That's a good bridge. That was one of the best ones we crossed, OK? You know, and it doesn't, and you've got a big rucksack on your back, and you have to think to yourself, is that going to take that? You might be lucky, you might not. <laughs> That's the expedition environment for you. You just don't know. Incidentally, I should point out the horses did take a different route from that. <laughs> okay, um, amusing expedition situations. This is part of a, a, an expedition environment where even though you're out in the middle of nowhere with a lot of people, and it's very unlikely that you do happen to, to bump into other people because you're in the middle of nowhere, it is remote. Occasionally, odd things happen, 
And in this case, we're walking through a huge valley. There was probably 10 miles in either direction, you can see mountains up either side. And we rounded a corner in the valley, and out of the blue, there's a small pocket of ladies and a couple of guys, and they are all dancing around a big stereo powered by a solar panel in the middle of the valley. And there they were. So um, wanting to sort of employ a kind of a convivial, friendly attitude, we joined in. And there we were, 100 miles from civilization, dancing around a stereo powered by solar power with some of the locals. And there they all are. And there we are for a nice convivial photo at the end of it. OK, um, that I didn't expect to happen. Amusing situations, there we are. <laughs> OK, and I realize that this um, it doesn't really look this actually is obviously not that amusing in itself. What gave rise to this was definitely very amusing, but can't really talk about it. <laughs> if, you, um, if you have any questions and you want to speak to me afterwards, maybe I'll explain what happened then, but I can't do it because the, guys who, the guy whose hand this is is here somewhere. I hope he's not here now. OK, um, challenges. Um, one of the big challenges that you have with leading anybody, and specifically young people, is uh, responsibility. And this level of responsibility is on a very personal level and on a professional level. And on a professional level, here I am with my qualifications and my fire. And these guys are standing on a glacier, which you can see disappearing up into the distance. Now, this glacier as all glaciers have, has crevasses all over it, OK? And you have the responsibility to make sure that all members of your team are roped up to make sure that if there's a situation where one of them steps over a piece of snow, which is covering a crevasse, and one of them goes down into that hole, that you've got the responsibility, you've got the mindset, the skills, and the calm demeanor to be able to deal with getting them out. And this is something that you have to deal with not every other day, not occasionally during the day, but during the course of the entire expedition. There is a very real chance that even if you save someone, if they've gone down a crevasse, they might have broken a leg, or they might have broken a bone, or they might be incapacitated in one way or another. And you have to remember that you're in an environment which is 100 miles away from civilization, and it's not a case of getting a helicopter in. You can't pick up a phone. You have to, the only way that you get people out of this environment is on the back of a horse, and it's a three-day walk. So it's not the kind of place where you want to hurt, get hurt, so you don't take any risks. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a degree of responsibility. Um, this level of responsibility obviously extends to dealing with situations when they do occur. Uh, this is a very uh, real situation which happened. Um, me and uh, the rest of the expedition were in the process of attempting a 6,000 meter summit that had previously never been summited before, another BSES first. And on this occasion, unfortunately, um, one of the girls who was a member of my fire did suffer um, what you would call uh, had the symptoms of a, a high altitude cerebral edema, which is obviously, if you don't know what that is, it's just consider it very, very high likelihood um, of dying. So what we did was we, um, the fire were fantastic, the Sherpas were fantastic, we got this girl back down to the high base camp from the position we were in. And then we took her, we had a medic with us, so we had her on oxygen, and we managed to get, um, managed to get her the right drugs. The Sherpas built a stretcher, as you can see here. And um, we managed to get her on the oxygen, we managed to pack her in. And all members of the fire and all members of the expedition that were with us manhandled this one girl down across you know, 
car-sized boulders from five and a half thousand meters down to about three and a half thousand meters where she were at Lowe's base camp and she made a full recovery. So it was all a good story at the end. But you know, you do bear in mind that this is again, this is a level of responsibility that you have to accept if you're going to become a leader. And you can't do it alone and you do need people around you. And the kind of people you have around you, such as doctors, the support of the Sherpas, are all the kind of things that make that happen. But you need to, you need to be calm, collective, and you need to organize it. You need to coordinate it. And you need to make sure that the function, you need to be able to stand back, take a calm approach, and look at the overall picture, and work out how this is going to be achieved. Anyway, so there you are. She's all right, and she's, she's back home. I should point out that there was, um, it, not that it's ever lucky that you have anybody with um, needs carrying off a mountain. But this girl was, um, bless her heart, probably five and a half stone. We had guys up there on this expedition that were 15 stone. I don't know what would have happened if we had to try and carry one of those guys off. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Right, how do you feel at the end of an expedition day? <laughs> um, this, is, this is another question which I'm not quite sure why everybody seems to feel is important. Um, to sort of make the point here, this is nowhere near the end of the day. And there you can see how they're feeling. This is probably, I, can't, I think we've just come off the summit at this point. We've just done another peak, which is around about five, 6,000 meters. And what happened here was that um, we got back to a, a safe place off the summit and then decided to uh, have a bit of a rest, at which point most of the expedition lie down and on these uncomfortable rocks just falls fast asleep. So that's how you feel halfway through the day. I don't need to probably explain how you feel at the end of the day. Right, most rewarding part of the job. What do we think that might be? Um, there's two aspects to what I think is the most rewarding part of the job. One of them is obviously um, achieving what you went out there for. Here we are. This is my, my fire, Zanskar fire standing at 6,100 meters at the top of a previously unclimbed mountain. Okay? No one's been up there before. Um, we took about 12 hours from the high base camp to get up there. And at that altitude, it, it's extremely hard work. And everybody's climbing very slowly. And everybody wants to stop every 30 seconds. And I'm sort of standing at the back going, get up there, get up there. Pretending that I can't feel the altitude at all, but of course I can. I'm trying to put on a brave face. And then when you get to the top, there's just elation with everybody. Absolutely. People are throwing snowboards, each other rolling around in the snow. They forget the hardship of actually having climbed to the top. And there's this enormous sense of achievement. Suddenly, the entire expedition realizes why they're there. They see this for the first time. They see themselves standing on the top of this mountain, and they realize why they're in that environment. They realize what all this has been for. And that collective sense of achievement is denominated from the teamwork that happened to get them up there. And so they realize they relied on each other. They've all clubbed together. They've all worked together. And together, they achieve. Right, how do you get involved with BSES? Um, this is a basically a very high, um, I've got, we've got plenty of um, information over there if you want to come and grab a leaflet. Depending on whether you're more interested in doing any leadership with BSES, the easiest thing is to pick up one of those brochures and call the office. The website has got leader application forms on there. It also talks about levels of qualification uh, that you might need, which are essentially I wouldn't say as important as just providing them with evidence that you've got the right character, you've got the right uh, you know, strength internally to deal with being a leader. And the BSES is very, very helpful. As you can see right back at the start with my own BSES, what I did was start out just being a fire leader. And these guys are going to put me on an expedition every year and I'm going to be a bit more advanced. So by 2012, I'm going to be a chief leader. Anyway, I didn't ever expect it to happen like that, but there you are. Anyway, so what next? Um, this is, uh, you know, really more just me scratching out some ideas about how I think it, it, it's worth getting, in, how to get involved, how to go about maximizing the opportunities when you get them. Um, if you're in the outdoor, if you're interested in being in the outdoors, this is 
you know, meeting as many people as possible is a really obvious thing to say. But what I would add is it seems to happen in the most unusual places. Um, one of the people who's been instrumental in my um, career development um, is a quite a famous polar explorer who I happen to meet on a first aid course, you know. And, you know, you meet people on these strange training courses that will be really useful contacts in the future. They are worth knowing. Um, spending money getting trained up, as that's what I did. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to, you know, to, to have the money to throw at a few bits of training. But, you know, you start small, start with weekends, start getting the basic competencies together. And it's worth spending your money because it will end up coming back to you in the end if you provide yourself with the relevant training and look like you're dedicated. Um, this one here, ar arbitrary experiences is a slightly unusual thing to talk about, but what I would say is that you have, with opportunities where you go and meet expedition companies and they take you out on occasional weekends to check whether or not you're, you're, you're competent to do this, these operate as training camps in themselves. You meet people, you get a chance to work with young people, you get a chance to work with charities, you get a chance to go out into the outdoor environment and, and this, even little weekends here and there, teach you about responsibilities of working with people. Everything counts. Um, developing new ideas. Um, again, the, it, the, I think one of the great things about what outdoor staff are doing here is the fact that they're trying to take what's otherwise a fragmented marketplace and develop it into something with some sense of um, some sense of logic, which the which the outdoor career um, environment doesn't really have at the moment. Um, take your ideas, work out, work, try a bit of everything, work out what you like, and then move on to the point where you think develop an area of expertise within something you like. Become fanatical about it. This is what I've become fanatical about. <laughs> um, this is me. Um, speeding across a plane um, in Norway on a kite, um, and that's the name of the company. And this is what happened. Through the career of me starting out as a, as a lowly, miserable lawyer, I've now developed myself into a position where I'm starting to think of my own ideas, starting to think of my own development, okay? my own plans, my own company, my own outdoor world. I'm not going to be looking um, at the screen. I don't and that is a position now, which, for me, Death it's by been PowerPoint, yeah. An interesting, sometimes very scary transition. Yeah, cool. And you'll switch it on. But within I guess. the space of only yeah, I'm not a few start years, speaking in there suddenly. you can make it happen. That's brilliant. Thanks and you can make much. it happen as well. That's everything I've got to say. Um, I'm just going to um, point out that in terms of the BSES information and any of the stuff, anyone that's any interested in any of the stuff that I did in Alaska, <laughs> that kind of core competency training in the outdoors, um, I've got information on all of that and I'm going to be hanging out over here in the corner for um, a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Okay? Thank you very much for listening.